In my last lecture, we looked at the Reformation as it occurred in England between the years 1534 and 1603. It, of course, had a good deal in common with the Reformation on the continent of Europe. Both disowned the Pope, both recovered the Scripture, and both adopted more or less what we call Calvinism. But there was a considerable difference, too. The Reformations in Germany, Switzerland, and Scotland were chiefly religious. They were led by deeply pious men who aimed at the glory of God. Thus, they adopted, for the most part, an uncompromising approach to their work. They care for only one thing. What saith the Scripture? The Scripture they followed is coherent, and therefore, so were the Reformations they achieved. The English Reformation, however, aimed a bit lower. It was inaugurated by King Henry VIII for the sole purpose of getting an illegal divorce. His successors, I'm sad to say, were not all that much better. Pragmatism, therefore, was its ruling principle. As a consequence, the English church remained half Reformed and half Catholic, half Evangelical and half liturgical, half Calvinistic and half Arminian. Its guiding document, the 39 Articles of Religion, is one of the great compromises in church history. It teaches both the sole authority of Scripture and permits the church to mandate tradition. It also teaches both justification by faith and baptismal regeneration. Perhaps on a more everyday level, its ministers, though only ministers, retained the title of priest and were still called father. They must, therefore, wear the proper attire in church. The difference, though, between a priest and a minister is not just a matter of terminology, but it's a matter of doctrine. A priest, by definition, is one who stands between a sinner and God. A priesthood, of course, was therefore needed before the coming of Christ. But after that time, it became both unnecessary and blasphemous. There's one God and one mediator between men and God, the man Christ Jesus. Kneeling at the Lord's Supper was also permitted and later required. This too seems to be trivial, but if you know its history, its importance becomes self-evident. Where did this notion of bowing before the elements come from? Well, the Roman Catholic dogma of transubstantiation. This means, of course, that the bread and wine become the literal body and blood of our Savior. And so what is the communicant doing when he's bowing to take the Holy Sacrament? Nothing less than worshipping the bread and the wine and worshipping anything but God is called idolatry. The Church of England, therefore, was a home for many diverse and contradictory elements, both Christians and idolaters were only too welcome within its walls. But this, of course, brings us to a question. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Jesus evidently thought not. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And English church history bears this out. A rupture in that church is detectable from the very beginning of its existence. It becomes more obvious, however, from the rise of Elizabeth, 1558, to the glorious revolution 130 years later. The opposing parties within the Church of England went by many names. Royalist and parliamentarian, cavalier and roundhead, and the one we'll use most often, Anglican and Puritan. In looking at Puritanism, I want to begin by offering a sketch of their history, then go on to try an essential definition of Puritanism, and finally show why Puritanism is important today, though no one really has gone by that name for several hundred years. Men called Puritan are first mentioned during the reign of Elizabeth I, 1558-1559. to 
Men like John Reynolds, Lawrence Chatterton, Thomas Cartwright, and William Perkins were among their leaders. Their original goals, quite frankly, were very modest. They wanted the church to be rid of what they called popish rags, that is, the priestly garments. They hoped that kneeling at the Lord's Supper would be abolished. They didn't believe in signing the cross. And oddly enough, they also protested the use of a ring in the wedding ceremony, thinking this implied that it was a sacrament. But they were even more moderate uh, than this list suggests. They hoped, of course, that the queen would abolish these abuses in all of the churches. But if she wouldn't go that far, they'd still be more or less satisfied. All they really wanted was the freedom to not sign the cross themselves, not bow at the Lord's Supper themselves, not use the semi-Catholic prayer book themselves. In other words, all they really wanted of the Queen was this. Don't make us use these things against our own consciences. That was really a very modest request. But to these concerns, I'm sad to say, Queen Elizabeth turned a deaf ear. She did it, it seems to me, because she, like her father, was basically a um, popeless Catholic. She accepted Protestantism, not because it is true, but because it enhanced her power. As a younger woman, in fact, she had gone to Mass. Her unwillingness to budge, even on these trifling matters, would stir up resentment on the part of her Puritan subjects who were growing every year. Elizabeth was strong, however, and the Puritans were weak. Thus, she was fairly successful in keeping them under her might, her royal thumb. But queens, of course, die. The truth does not. And so, at Elizabeth's death, her son James I took the throne. In James, the Puritans thought they had hit the jackpot. He was brought up in Scotland and professed Calvinism. But their hopes were soon bitterly disappointed. James was, arguably, the worst man to ever sit on, the, on England's throne. He was an apostate and heretic, a dictator, and a homosexual. It's odd that the most popular Bible ever translated into English bears his name. But he was not an idiot. He knew precisely what the issue was, perhaps better than the Puritans did themselves. He understood that what they were getting at was this, the authority of God's word over everyone and everything up to and including the king. And so, as you might guess, James treated the Puritan party with great contempt. His most famous quote concerned the Puritans. If they would not conform to his religious standards, he would, quote, harry them out of the kingdom, chase them off. In this, he was only too successful. The cream of English character fled his island and landed in America. The pilgrims, of course, up in Plymouth, and the Puritans in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But the island was not entirely drained by these departures. No, like Israel under the persecutions of Pharaoh, the Puritans multiplied greatly under the rule of James. And soon the land began to teem and swarm with these pesky Puritans. This brings us, though, to the reign of Charles I, a man only too worthy of his evil father. He ruled from 1629, uh, 1625 to 1649. From a political standpoint, Charles was an absolutist. He believed that all power should be concentrated in the crown. Thus, he would dissolve parliament at will. Once, in fact, he ruled by decree for eleven long years. This was both monstrous and illegal. The Magna Carta, you've heard of that no doubt, had been signed four hundred years earlier and limited the power of the king and guaranteed the rights of the people through their lords or the noblemen. Religiously, Charles was a Catholic. He married the, prince, uh, the French princess Henrietta Maria, another illegal act. He aimed to erase the Reformation in England and bring the island back to popery. This was too much, though, for the Puritans to take. They believed in, as the scripture taught, the rule of law and not the rule of men. 
In other words, even the king must bow to the law of God. They could not tolerate idols brought into the church of God. And so after exhausting every other possibility, Parliament reluctantly declared war on the king. Under the leadership of Pym and Hampden, the Puritan cause suffered one setback after another. These men may have been very excellent legislators, but they were dreadful generals. And so finally, Parliament turned to, its, to the only officer who had any success against the Anglicans. His name was Colonel Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell went to work building an army. He recruited only God-fearing men and drilled them severely. He enforced a strict code of conduct among his soldiers. No gambling, no swearing, no drinking. But he also encouraged piety. The finest Puritan preachers were called as chaplains, including Richard Baxter, who didn't serve, and John Owen, who did. The officers and men spent their free time not carousing as soldiers most often do, but in Bible reading, praying, and godly conversation. They marched into battle singing hymns. They were called the New Model Army. And a new model they were. Oliver thought that he who fears God cannot fear man. Thus a Christian would be the bravest of all soldiers. And history proved his thinking right. The New Model Army never lost a war, and in fact, never even lost a battle. The Royalist army was everywhere routed and soundly beaten. The Puritans under Cromwell now took over the government of England and held absolute sway in the island. But what would they do? Well, the first order of business concerned the king. He was a criminal, to be sure, but he was also the king. The English are a conservative people, not comfortable with overturning traditions. And so Oliver tried negotiating with Charles, but to no effect. For while promising every concession, the king was also plotting with the Pope and his French relatives for an invasion of his own country. If tens of thousands must die in order to restore the king, so be it. At least that's how Charles thought. Finally, every compromise... Every negotiation, every deal proved futile. The king was an incorrigible liar and schemer, and so there was nothing more to be done with him but send him to the gallows. And so on January 30th, 1649, King Charles was executed by order of the English Parliament. This left the English scene chaotic. The nation, after all, had been a monarchy from time immemorial. Now with the king dead, what would it become? Well, it became a commonwealth or a republic under the rule of parliament. But the parliament, which was largely made up of Puritans, was very inefficient, and I'm sad to say, very petty and partisan and argumentative. England was in a downward spiral. The... Uh, Parliament simply couldn't keep things together. And so Oliver Cromwell, the only man capable of ruling the nation, was named Lord Protector. There he served for about ten years until his death in 1658. This era has often been called a military dictatorship. And so it was, if by military dictatorship you mean a soldier was in charge. But when we speak of military dictatorship, what we ordinarily mean is a despotic government, a cruel government, an uncompromising, unyielding, and vicious government. Well, Oliver's was anything but those things. It was far more than a military dictatorship. It was, in short, the flowering of Puritan culture. In the field of religion, Puritans are often thought to be intolerant of others, and bitterly sectarian. But under Oliver's rule, England enjoyed for the first time in her history a measure of religious freedom. There was no established church for the first time ever. Even Cromwell's church, he was a Congregationalist, was not mandated by law. Even the hated Episcopalians were allowed to worship in their own way so long as they did it privately. Not even Catholics 
were persecuted for worshipping God according to the dictates of their own conscience. In fact, Oliver Cromwell invited the Jews back to England. And so in the field of religion, England enjoyed for the first time in its long history a measure of religious freedom. Or look at politics. Cromwell's long shadow hovered over all of Europe and secured a good deal of protection for the Protestants in other lands. I think it was just coincidental that during this period of time there were not constant slaughters of evangelical Christians throughout Europe. The men of Piedmont did die during this time. But uh, this was considered such an atrocious act and Cromwell was so incensed by it that even the Pope paid him due respect and the Protestant and Evangelical Christians throughout Europe enjoyed a respite because of the great influence of Oliver. Look at education. Among the finest universities of England were founded in this brief ten years span. Oliver Cromwell himself founded the University of Durham. In America, of course, Harvard was founded in a wilderness within ten years of the Puritan landing. The Christian schools, moreover, were not staffed by what we so often find today ignorant saints or sinful scholars but scholarly saints were the rule in all of the Puritan institutions if you should be interested in English culture during the Puritan era let me just call out two names which speak for themselves John Milton John Bunyan was there ever a greater poet than Milton was there ever a greater dreamer than the Bedford Tinker and so a culture also flourished When we look at the social issues, Puritans are often portrayed as heartless, men without an ounce of charity in them. I've got mine by hard work, now you get yours in the same way. At least that's how the caricature is drawn. But historically, we find just the opposite being true. Lancelot Andrews was a godly Anglican. He was not a Puritan. He was not a friend of the Puritans. Yet he must observe about the Puritans this, quote, The Puritans were able to do so much good as not one of their poor is seen to beg in the streets. The historian W.K. Jordan, another person, no friend of the Puritans, draws a sharp contrast between the social conditions of Catholic and Anglican England and Puritan England. Here's his quotation. The Catholic Middle Ages were acutely sensitive to the spiritual needs of mankind while displaying the scantiest concern for the alleviation of poverty, misery, and ignorance. But then, in describing the work of charitable organizations, he notes, quote, a very large proportion of the donors were Puritans. Puritans also preached and when in power enforced what we would call consumer rights. They were advocates for the consumer. Richard Baxter attacked men for, quote, selling goods for more than they are worth, making a product seem better than it is, concealing flaws in a product, and taking advantage of another's necessity. Profiteering, in other words, was frowned on in Puritan England. And so, during this ten years under the reign of Cromwell, England enjoyed in my opinion at least, its finest era ever. But you know, even the great Cromwell couldn't live forever. He died in 1658, aged 59 years. His son Richard took over for him, but not being the man his father was, couldn't handle the responsibility and quit after about three years. His abdication ushered in the return of the monarchy. And so Charles' son named Charles II, landed from Europe and took up the reins of government. And he, I'm sad to tell you, walked in the ways of his father and made England to sin. He too was a closet Catholic and did everything within his power to undo Puritanism. In England, he had the body of Cromwell exhumed and publicly hanged. He also decreed the notorious Act of Uniformity, This law reintroduced superstition in the churches. It was another attempt to make the state church Catholic. Many noble ministers refused and were thrown out of their pulpits in the great ejection of 1662. 
More than 2,000 godly men suffered in this way, including my favorite Puritan, Thomas Watson. Charles also imprisoned men for preaching the gospel without his approval. The best known among these was, of course, the immortal dreamer, John Bunyan. But if he was cruel in England, he was downright monstrous in Scotland. Charles II required the Scottish Presbyterian Church to submit to episcopacy. In other words, rule by bishops. The Presbyterians refused. This set off more than 25 years of bloody persecution, which the, which the uh, Scottish called the killing times. Holy men, called covenanters, were routinely brutalized, exiled, and murdered. James Guthrie, his brother, wrote one of the finest little books you can get, The Christian's Great Interest, William Guthrie. But James Guthrie was killed and, and had his head put up high on a fence as a warning to others. The hatred of Charles, however, was insatiable. And so he plotted with Louis XIV, King of France, to revoke the Edict of Nantes once again making Protestantism illegal in Louis' kingdom. This led to further atrocities, burnings, and so on. Well, after 25 brutal years in power, Charles II mercifully died. On his deathbed, he formally converted to Catholicism and so earned the just recompense of reward. He was succeeded by his son, James II, who, unlike his father, was an avowed Catholic from the start. He kept up the persecution of, Purit of Puritanism and tried unsuccessfully to bring England back into the papal fold. Happily, he was overthrown by the great Christian soldier and king William of Orange, also called William III, also called William the Silent, who ruled with Mary. William and Mary, you've heard of that college. William, once and for all, broke Catholic power in England and offered toleration and a good deal of freedom to the Puritans. They were grateful for his charity and esteemed him very highly indeed. His campaign has been rightly called the Glorious Revolution. It took place in 1689. At his ascent, Puritans more or less lost their name and became for the most part dissenters or nonconformists. The Puritans, for the most part, though not entirely, left the Church of England and formed the various denominations that we know today, like Presbyterian, Congregational, Baptist, and others. Under this wise man's rule, William III, the religious wars of England were put to an end once and for all. I hope to talk more about William next time. Well, enough for the history of Puritanism. We must now move on to perhaps the most important question, and that's this. What is Puritanism, and why is it important to us? Well, Puritanism is not, and never was, a denominational name. It is not to be used, therefore, like Presbyterian, Baptist, or Methodist. There were, in fact, Puritans in many churches. Puritanism, moreover, does not even require a particular theological viewpoint. The great majority of Puritans were Pedo-Baptists and Calvinists, but not all of them were. The Baptists were generally Puritan. Some of the staunchest Anglicans were also Calvinistic. And men like, uh, men like Usher and Layton. And one of the greatest Puritans was Richard Baxter. He, though somewhat confused, was basically Arminian. And so Puritanism is not a denomination and it's not just another name for either pedo-baptism or Calvinism. So what is it? What is Puritanism? Well, let me just briefly explain the name itself. What word comes from... From what word does Puritan come? The answer is purity or pure. Puritans were therefore were interested in purifying. Purifying themselves, purifying their families, their churches, and their state. That's really what the name comes from. But it seems to me that's not really the best definition possible. Uh, Puritanism can be defined, I think, best in the famous quote of John Knox. Reformation without tarrying for any. 
Reformation without tearing or waiting around for anybody. That's really what sets the Puritans apart from the Anglicans and other Christian groups. The Puritans were interested in reforming their lives and their homes, their churches and their state, and they wanted to do it now. Puritan, therefore, is zealous for God. He is not interested in compromise or half measure. He believes that God's word should be implemented in full and now. That's really what the essence of Puritanism is. Reformation without tarrying for any. For any. But he's not a hypocrite. He's not interested, as the caricature is, He's not interested in taking the speck out of other people's eyes while leaving the beam in his own eye. He begins with himself. Self-mastery takes first place. And this means chiefly the cultivation of conscience. Nothing was left out. The most careful self-examination was regularly practiced by the Puritans. Two men are especially uh, illustrative of this. Henry Scudder and Richard Baxter. Henry Scudder was an English Puritan who wrote a book entitled The Christian's Daily Walk in Holy Security and Peace. Just looking at the table of contents really gives you the burden uh, or gives you the thrust of Scudder's idea. Here's some of the things that he says. How to awake with God by pious meditation and thanksgiving. Suitable reflections on apparel and rules concerning it. Rules concerning eating and drinking. Rules concerning recreation. Rules concerning company in general. Now, Scudder was a man and therefore imperfect. And so he may have had a dose of the Pharisee in him, maybe. But the point is this. He was interested in doing everything for the glory of God. Nothing was unimportant to God and therefore nothing could be unimportant to the Puritan. The very hairs of our head are numbered by God and therefore the Puritan was interested in pleasing God not just in the big things in life like going to church or choosing a mate but in even the smallest things. How to get dressed for the glory of God. What to think about when you wake up in the morning. How much you should eat. How much you should drink. Um, what kind of company you should keep. Things like these were very important to the Puritans. And that's because they wanted their conscience at every point enlightened by the word of God. Richard Baxter was another example of this. Baxter wrote more than most people could ever read. But his burden was what he called cases of conscience in which he addresses the most intricate questions so that nothing could be done without a good conscience toward God. His giant Christian directory is over a thousand pages long, double columned and with tiny print as I try to squint through these, uh, some of these questions. Here are just some of them that I found. Directions for the government of the faults. Directions for the government of the passions. Directions for the government of the senses. Directions for the government of the ear. Directions for the government of the taste and appetite. Direction against sinful excessive sleep. And the most interesting, directions against sinful dreams. The Puritans thought that God was even interested in what you did while asleep. And therefore, this too must be brought to the touchstone of Scripture. Some of the questions that he asks in this Christian directory are truly remarkable. Things that we've not even given a thought to. Strange things. Things we would answer just out of common sense and never go to the Bible at all. For example... He asked a question, should a wife stay with a husband who threatens to murder her? He says yes, because she'd be a martyr for Christ. Strange things, huh? But now he may not be right in every issue, and he's certainly wrong in some ways, Baxter was. But the point is this, he wanted to cultivate his conscience. He didn't want to do anything that could be displeasing to God. 
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. All right? Richard Rogers stated the Puritan view well. When someone said to him, Oh, Mr. Rogers, you're so precise about things, Rogers gave the famous answer, I serve a precise God. But the Puritan zeal is not confined to personal holiness. It also extended to his home. According to Isaac Ambrose, a husband and wife have the task of doing what? Just getting along well enough so as to be respectable? No. They have the task of, quote, erecting and establishing Christ's glorious kingdom in their house. And so again, long quotations could be given on uh, the husband's duties to his wife, the wife's duties to her husbands, how parents ought to treat children, how children ought to respect parents, how grown children ought to care for their aged parents, things like this. Great detail. This, these issues are dealt with in the greatest detail. It also should be stated very bluntly that these people were not, for the most part, legalistic at home. They were very loving and warm and, and tender. You can go through Puritan sermons on the family and you'll almost never see a sermon directed to husbands that does not deal with this issue. Husbands, you're the head of the wife, but only in the same way that Christ is the head of the church. He's the Savior of the body. Christ loves and nourishes and cherishes the church. And so we husbands ought to deal with our wives with great tenderness and affection and long-suffering and patience. These things are dealt with in nearly every sermon that I've read on family living by the Puritans. Not beat your wife into submission. Not rule like a little tyrant. But rather rule by the rule of love. That was one of the ideas that the Puritans always stressed. Same thing to the wife. At that time, for the most part, women were largely disparaged uh, in the world. They were thought to be second class citizens. They were thought to be more or less servants. But the wives are urged to submit to their husbands, not because the wives are inferior to their husbands, but because it's the will of God. And that by submitting to their husbands, they don't, they don't only get along better at home, but they also earn the reward of the inheritance. Children were to, were to be very respectful to their parents, and parents were to pray earnestly and daily for their children. One of the Puritans, I think it was one of the mothers here, in America, it was said he never talked to his children without saying a word about Christ. Never. Playing with them, wrestling with them, joking with them, walking out in the field, he never wasted an opportunity unless he say a word for God. And so, these men served a precise God and therefore sought to serve God precisely. Puritans, therefore, were, interest, were great homebodies interested in the welfare of their families. Work was also very important to the Puritans. You don't have to read very far in their writings to find laziness excoriated and reproved everywhere. Laziness was constantly attacked. Too much sleep, goofing off at work, being men-pleasers, holding up walls and such things were absolutely forbidden by the Puritans. So it's not surprising that during the Puritan ascendancy in England, economics really skyrocketed because these people worked rather than goofed off for a living. Calling was also emphasized. In other words, that the minister is not the only called Christian. Every Christian, without exception, has a calling. He's to discover what his calling is, and he's to stay with it and to glorify God in it. Persistence in work was greatly emphasized one man, Cotton Mather, said, A Christian should follow his occupation with contentment. A Christian should not be too ready to fall out with his calling. Many a man, merely from covetousness and from discontent, throws up his business. So work was very important to the Puritans, as was money. A list of quotations will do when it comes to the Puritan view of money. I'll just put them together. Money exists for the glory of God and the good of others. 
The more diligently we pursue our callings, the more we are capacitated to extend our charity to such as are in poverty and distress. God's children look to the spiritual use of those things which worldly, which, which worldlings use carnally. So money was also important. Money didn't belong to you. They did, in a sense, they did not believe in private property. They believed that the earth was the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they who dwell therein. And therefore they believed that we had to give an account for every shilling we spent. It must all be spent for the glory of God. Education was also very important. William Perkins was of the opinion that, quote, where ignorance reigneth, there reigneth sin. And unlike many of us, these people were willing to really pay for an education. The founding of Harvard College is a monument to the Puritan interest in and sacrifice for education. You know the story of the Puritans and the pilgrims and so on. You know how they came to America. It was a howling wilderness. They were threatened by Indians. They nearly starved to death. They nearly froze to death and so on. You know all the hardships they endured in America. You know they built Harvard College within ten years of the landing. Ten years. Now that is absolutely incredible. And they did it on a shoestring because they were willing to sacrifice. And remember, folks, these people lived in a wilderness, married young, and had just oodles and oodles of kids. And so these people were interested in every part of their lives. Money, education, family, you name it. They were at work, you name it, they were interested in it. But they were more than interested just in their own home and immediate concerns. The church, too, must be reformed according to the word of God. Not everyone was welcome in the membership of early Puritan churches. The congregation, what we would call visitors, often outnumbered the communicants by more than four to one. Good preaching was the rule rather than the exception. Good hearing was equally found in Puritan assemblies. And so again, I could take you through my Puritan books and find sermon after sermon on how to listen to sermons. Remedies for the distracting cares in worship. In other words, how to pay attention to a sermon and profit from it. So the church must be reformed. You see, they weren't just a bunch of nuts and fanatics who didn't like crosses and didn't like men doing things like this. That wasn't what their argument was. They said, the reason you don't put crosses in church, the reason you don't sign the cross, the reason you don't kneel for the Lord's Supper, is not because we don't like these things. The reason you don't do these things is because Jesus Christ is the only head of the church and He alone has the right to dictate policy for His church. And therefore, unlike the Lutherans, they adopted the regulative principle of worship. The Lutherans, the Anglicans... Many other Christian sects say whatever God has not forbidden is permitted. If it's not strictly forbidden in the Bible, then it's allowed. Now we know we're finding in the Bible uh, a prohibition of a cross. We don't find the Bible ever saying, Thou shalt not cross thyself, or thou shalt not kneel at the Lord's Supper. You never find things like that. And so on account of that, Anglicans and uh, Lutherans and, and uh, a lot of other people uh, adopt these things. Not forbidden. If you criticize it, they hold the Bible. I say, where is that forbidden? You can't say anything, so they say, therefore, it's okay. But the Puritans held the regulative principle of worship which says, if it's not commanded, it is forbidden. That's the idea. If it's not commanded, it is forbidden. And so, because crosses are not forbidden in the church, because kneeling at the Lord's Supper is not commanded, because gorgeous apparel... For the priest is not commanded because priests are not called priests in the New Testament. Ministers are not called priests in the New Testament because they're never called father and so forth. These things are not permitted in the church. So the church must be reformed according to the word of God. And even the state must be brought under the authority of Christ. Puritans therefore prayed earnestly for the rulers. As much as their calling permitted, they involved themselves in the affairs of state. And well-qualified Puritans ran for office and were often elected and served well. John Winthrop, for example, was not only an outstanding governor of Massachusetts, he was an even better Christian. 
All of these achievements were gained under the blessing of God for one reason. The Puritans were uncompromising in their integrity and single-eyed in their devotion to God. The Puritans believe and in fact wrote the Westminster Shorter Catechism which begins with that immortal question, what is the chief end of man? And the Puritans wrote, believed and practiced, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So the Puritans, single-eyed, living for the glory of God, did more in ten years in England than many hundreds of years accomplished under the rule of others. So be it.